unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed. The only reason why I have not yet lost heart is because I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But the moment I stop believing that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I'll lose heart. And then he ends the chapter by saying this, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, I want to talk to you today about losing heart. Hmm. What does it mean to lose heart? Yeah. Notice that the psalmist defines the phenomenon of losing heart as the inability to believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The psalmist says, I possess my heart as long as I continue to believe that I'll see the goodness of the Lord In the land of the living. Not after I die. Not in heaven one day. Not in the hereafter. But in the land of the living. Right here, right now, I'm still believing that I I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let me ask you a question. What goodness of the Lord are you expecting to receive in the land of the living? What goodness of the Lord are you looking forward to right now? What season of blessing and breakthrough and victory are you expecting to break forth into your life right now? If you have no answer to that question, you've lost heart. And the loss of heart means when you lose your heart, it doesn't mean you've lost your positive outlook on life. Because there's actually a lot of people who have a positive outlook on life, but who've completely lost heart. Losing heart means you've lost the impetus to act. You've lost the motivation to do something. If you have no motivation to act, to fight, to build something, to fix something, to make a contribution to the world, to make the world a better place, to make your life a better place, to make your family's life a better place, if there's no motivation to act, to create something, to work towards something, you've lost heart. You've completely lost heart. Yeah. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Paul says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. I'm going to say that again. He says, We constantly pray for you that our God, number one, will make you worthy of his calling and number two, that he may bring to fruition... Your every desire for goodness. What desire for goodness do you have in you that God can, might bring to fruition? That God may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. You need some deeds. See, your faith should prompt some deeds. Remember James said, faith without works is dead. What he meant is that faith is not just about believing something, but faith should provoke you to do something, to build something, to fix something, that there's a battle that you should be fighting, but you're not fighting because you've lost heart. You've lost heart. That life has just become about survival for you. Just making it. You've lost heart because you're no longer believing that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Right now, in the land of the living. Not after I die, today. In the land of the living. Every deed, if it's prompted by faith, comes with the expectation of the goodness of the Lord that will be the result of it. And the goodness of the Lord that you will see in the land of the living. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is is the wellspring of life. Mm. I like that. That's the old 1984 New International Version. Mm. But the updated International Version says, Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it springs the issues of life. Or or everything you do flows out of it. The NKJV says, Mm. Out of it springs the issues of life. 
the NIV says, everything you do flows out of it. Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows out of it. And if you lose your heart, if you lose heart, it means you can't do nothing. Some of you look at certain situations in your life and you're frozen. You can't do nothing. Why? You've lost heart. And why have you lost heart? Because you stopped believing that you would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living in that area of your life. Some of you look at your marriage and you've lost heart. Can't do nothing about it. Some of you look at your finances and you've lost heart. Can't do nothing about it. Some of you look at your health and you've lost heart. Can't do nothing about it. You look at your vocation and you've lost heart. Can't do nothing about it. You look at your kids and you've lost heart. Can't do nothing about it. And in any area of your life where you look at it and you can't do nothing about it and you're stuck and you're trapped and you just, well, I just wait till Jesus comes. Lost heart. Catastrophic loss of heart. And the psalmist ends that chapter by saying, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. What does it mean when he strengthens your heart? It means he gives you your lost heart back. God comes to you and says, you've lost this. What is this? It's your heart. You lost it. I found it. I'm bringing it back to you. I want to give you the gift of your heart. Now, I'm giving this to you. Now you guard it. Above all else, guard this. With all diligence, guard this. Why? Because it's the wellspring of life. Out of it flows everything you do. And if you don't guard this and hold on to this and keep this, you're going to lose heart again tomorrow. I'm tired of finding your heart. I'm tired of sweeping your house and finding your heart because you keep losing it. It rolls under the bed. And now I have to move the furniture out of the way to look for your heart and put it back in your chest because you keep losing it. Guard it, please. Be diligent to guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Now there's this passage of scripture that I love, the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17 about this young man, David. He's got older brothers. His older brothers go to the battlefield. He stays home to watch the sheep. We all, most of us know the story of David. David was the paradigmatic king of Israel. He was the second king of Israel, but he was the real king of Israel. He was the guy who was, he established the kingdom of Israel. And this, Jesus was called the son of David. He, Jesus came through the line of David. David lived about 1000 BC. Uh, so David, um, his dad calls him and says, hey, listen, you need to go to the battlefield and check on your brothers and take some food to them and take some cheese to the commander and uh, see how they're doing. Come back and bring me a report. And so David, sure enough, he packs his bags and he goes to the battlefield. And when he gets there, he sees his brothers. He's like, hey, brothers, how you guys doing? And he's asking them how they are. And when he's standing there talking to them, all of a sudden, everything gets quiet because this huge, humongous giant is over here screaming on the Philistine side and he's defying the people of Israel. Come out and fight. Send somebody to fight me. I'll kill you. I'll tear you up. I'll feed your flesh to the birds. I'll kill all y'all. F y'all. Forget, you know, he's just cussing out Israel and bringing, calling down curses by his gods, cursing the God of Israel. And the scripture said that when the, when the Israelites heard them, they turned and fled. The, this man is defying the God of Israel and the Israelites hear him and they turn and flee. They run for their lives. Why do they turn and flee? Because they lost heart. Yeah. Yeah. That is, they see a problem and the problem looks like a giant. Yeah. Every problem in your life is a giant. Yeah. A Goliath yeah. who mocks you, yeah. who mocks your God, yeah. who says, in this area, in this, this problem, when you're facing me, you don't have a God. You might as well be an atheist when you're facing me because your God can't do nothing about me. You can believe in him in every other area of your life. But when you're facing me, you might as well just run and hide because there's nothing you can do about me. The Israelites lost heart. See, that's the thing about losing heart. When you lose heart, it tends not to be a total and complete catastrophic loss of heart, but an acute loss of heart in one particular area of your life. People see you as the most positive, motivated person in every other area of your life. But when you face this one giant, yeah. this one Goliath, yeah. you run and, run and hide, run and flee. Wow. Run and flee. Wow. Now watch what David does. He's talking to his brother. He's like, who is this? <laughs> well, what, the, what in the world is going on? Why does somebody just go kill him? Yeah. Like, no, man, that's the giant, man. That's, that's the champion from Gath. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm doing this because my hands are cold. It's freezing up in this mug. <laughs> <laughs> that's the champion from Gath don't you know if you fight him he's going to kill you 
And David's like, well, what happens if I kill him? Listen to what David says. What happens if I kill him? And they're like, man, the man who kills this giant, the king is going to give him his daughter in marriage. His family will have no taxes to pay. He's going to be a, a commander in the army. He's going to be, you know, he's going to be famous in Israel. He's like, really? For real? And then he turns to somebody else. He goes, hey, what's going to happen to the guy who kills that giant? And they go, oh, man, the guy who kills that giant, the king's going to give him his daughter as his wife. He's got, his family's going to be exempted from taxes. He's going to be a commander in the army. He's going to be famous in Israel. David's like, for real? For real? And then David turns to somebody else and goes, hey, what's going to happen to the man who kills that giant? Oh, the man who kills that giant, he's going to be, he's, the, the king's going to give him his wife. He's going to be rich. His family's not going to pay taxes. He's going to be a commander in the army in Israel. And David's like, oh, for real? For real? And he turns to somebody else. What's going to happen to the man who kills? Why does David keep asking that same question? He's focusing his mind on the opportunity, not the obstacle. He's focusing his mind on what's on the other side of the victory instead of focusing his mind on what's on the other side of the defeat. You see, the reason you lose heart is because you're so focused on what happens if you are defeated instead of what happens if you're victorious. All you're thinking about is, if I face this giant and lose, here's what's going to happen. You should be thinking about, if I face this giant and win, here's what's going to happen. Your mind is focused on defeat instead of victory, and that's why you're running in fear. David is building up his confidence and building up his faith by continuing to ask the question, what happens if I win? You don't do nothing because you're constantly asking, but what happens if I lose? But what happens if this happens? But what happens? But what happens if? What happens if I lose my job? If I try to start a business, what happens if it fails? What happens if? What happens if the econ if I buy a house? What happens if the economy tanks? What happens if? What happens if? What happens if? You're constantly asking the question, "What happens if?" And on the other side of the "if" is something bad, and that's why you lose heart. That's why you ain't got no faith to do nothing because you're too afraid of what happens if Goliath kills you. And David has no fear of what happens if he loses. If I lose, I just die. Everybody knows that. But if I win, wow. if I win, after I win, yeah. right? After I win, the king's daughter's about to be my wife. After I win, my family ain't going to pay no taxes. After I win, I'm going to be a commander in the king's army. My mind is focused on what's coming after I win. I can face any Goliath if my mind is focused on what happens after I win. But I can't even fight a dwarf if my mind is focused on what happens after I lose. Some of you have been stopped by little imps, little demonic imps. The weakest devil in hell stops you. Because wow. all he has to do is say, here's what happens if you lose. Wow. And your mind gets so focused. That's why everybody else is running in fear when they see Goliath. Yeah. They lost heart. And then David's brother hears him asking that question. And David's brother Eliab comes over and it says he burned with anger. So everybody else, they, Israel runs in fear. David rises up in faith. But his brother hears him rising up in faith and burns with anger. How dare you? How dare you believe you can beat that giant? What's wrong? You're just filled with pride. As soon as you get some faith, somebody's going to call it pride. Some unbelieving person is going to tell you you're moving in pride simply because you're believing for something that they can't believe for. Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew you were full of pride. Go back to those few sheep. You see, you hear what he's saying? You're so little. Just go back and be content with the few sheep that our father asked you to, you know, you shouldn't be out here anyway. Go back home to those sheep. Yeah. And David didn't disrespect his brother. He simply ignored him. Yeah you got to learn that there's an appropriate place to ignore even your brothers. Even your brothers and sisters who love you. Even your father and your mother. Even your best friends. Why? Because there's a potentiality on the inside of you that nobody knows except you and God. And the people around you may not see it. But there is a potentiality on the inside of you that is connected to two things. Number one, your unmanifested skills and gifts. There's no way people can see you and believe you can kill that giant. Why? You still look like a little kid to them because of your unmanifested gifts. Wow. All of us have unmanifested yeah. gifts on the other, on, inside of us. Potentialities that nobody has seen yet. Even you haven't seen yet. But you sense it. 
If you would open your heart and open your ears, you'd begin to sense on the inside of you that you have a gift that nobody sees yet, that nobody knows. And we depend on the people around us to be able to prophetically discern it, but there's stuff on the inside of you that nobody can prophetically discern. Only you and God know it's there. But that potentiality, that unmanifested gift, is coupled with your secret history. Because David had a secret history of victory that nobody knew but him and God. And God set it up that way that he had battles in the past that he won that nobody saw. A battle with a lion, a battle with a bear that nobody saw. That there's a secret history between you and God where you have had to fight lions and bears that nobody knew you had to fight. Coupled with that secret, that unmanifested potential. David had faith because he correlated his present problem with his past victories. He looked at the giant and then asked himself, where can I find a victory in my past that corresponds to the problem in my present? Because if you'll look carefully enough, there's something in your past that has already prepared you to face the giant in your present. The rest of Israel ran in fear because they could not see anything in their past that prepared them to face the giant of their present. And that's why nobody believed with David. But that's okay. I don't need you to believe with me. I don't need you to see what I see because I know I'm the one who fought the lion and the bear and killed them. Now David is going around and he turns away from his brother Eliab and says, what did I do? I can't even talk. All I'm doing is talking. And then immediately he turns away from his brother and turns to somebody else and goes, what's going to happen to the man who kills this giant? He doesn't focus on the negativity. He doesn't focus on the doubt. He doesn't focus on the naysayers. He doesn't focus on the ones who would limit him, who would put limitations on what victories he can achieve. He simply turns and refocuses his mind on what's on the other side of victory. What's going to happen to the man who kills this giant? What's, what's going to happen to the man who deals with this problem? What's going to happen to the man? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if I win this battle? Why does he keep asking? You know what he's doing? He's waiting on the Lord and he's being of good courage. He doesn't simply run, run straight. No, he doesn't simply run at Goliath immediately. He's building up his faith by focusing on his future. He's building up his faith. Listen, you need that incubation period where you simply focus your mind on what's going to happen on the other side of this victory. Don't just plunge right into that new degree program in school. Spend a few months going, what's going to happen after I get this degree? What's going to, and ask people, what happens to people who get this degree? Focus your mind on it. See it. Pray. Pray into it. Focus your mind on it. See it. Listen, your strength will come. God will strengthen your heart if you are of good courage. You wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And being of good courage means conditioning your mind and heart to see what's on the other side of the problem. And now he's asked so many people that word gets back to the king. Everybody in Israel is running in fear, but there's one little kid out there who's talking like he's a gangster. And, And Saul's like, well, bring him to me. And David comes into his, court, into, his, into his court, verse 32, I believe it is. David says, don't let anyone lose heart. Yeah. You hear what David says? Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your yeah. servant will go and kill him. <laughs> don't lose heart. Tell, tell your people to stop losing heart yeah. because of this Philistine. Mm. They have no motivation, no impetus to act. No desire for goodness that God can bring to fruition. Yeah. No deeds prompted by their faith. But I've got a desire for goodness. And a motivation to act. Some deeds prompted by my faith. My faith tells me I can go kill that giant. So tell everybody, stop losing heart. Don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to handle this. And the king's like, you're not able to do this. You're just a boy. He's been a fighting man since his youth. You're not able to do this. You are not able. Not even the king could see the potentiality that God had put on the inside of this young man. Not even the king. Listen, you need to be careful before you tell anybody that they can't do something that God has put in your heart. You need to be careful saying you can't do this. You need to speak the opposite. When somebody says I can't, you need to say you need to get your heart back. You need to ask God to sweep your house clean and find your heart because it fell out of your chest and it ran under the couch. Maybe it slipped in between the cushions and the couch. 
Find your heart. You're not able. And now David is going to recount his secret history. He says, let me tell you something, king. I'm a shepherd. Yeah, shepherd boy. That's all I am. I've never been a warrior. But I tell you what. I've had to do things that nobody else in your army has ever done. Once when I was guarding my sheep, a lion came after my flock. You know what I did? I grabbed my staff and I struck that lion down and killed him. Another time a bear came after my flock. You know what I did? I grabbed my staff and struck down that bear and I killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like them. Correlation. This present problem is just like my past problems. I overcame my past problems. I'm going to overcome this problem. Let me tell you something. The fact that you are here today, the fact that you are listening to me today, means that your success rate against your trials is 100%. Because there hasn't been one that's killed you yet. You're still here. You're still alive. You're still breathing. That means you have overcome everything. David said in another place, I know that God is pleased with me because my enemies can't defeat me. They haven't defeated me yet. They haven't taken me out yet. There hasn't been a trial in your life that has succeeded in taking you out yet. That means God's not done with you. That means God is with you. That means the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you. That means that God has future victories in store for you. That means that you can defeat the Goliath that's standing before you right now. Come on, somebody. You need to get your heart back today. You've let your heart lay on the floor, rolled up in a corner. You've left your heart under a trash pile. You need to do the laundry because it's somewhere down in some jeans that you haven't worn in years, in the pocket of a coat that you haven't put on. You need to find your heart. And the king, the king says, all right. Now think about this. Watch this. The king actually had some faith. Because if you think about it, it's really crazy to let a little kid go fight a battle. The result of which, if he loses, all of us are enslaved. I mean, think about it. Like, there's a giant outside, a huge gangster. And we're all up here in the church. And the gangster's like, I'll fight anybody one-on-one. All of us are afraid, but Obi. And Obi comes to me and goes, Pastor Benjamin, I'll go fight him. Yeah. And I'll tell you why I could fight him. Because my sister Rumi used to like to, t- to tickle me all the time. <laughs> and last time she tried to tickle me, I put her in a headlock. <laughs> and she went to sleep. <laughs> right? How much faith would it take for me to say, you know what, Obi? Go out there and fight on behalf of all. Oh, and by the way, if you lose, they're going to take this whole church. Literally, the the point was, whoever wins that battle gets to enslave the other side. The king, at some point, looked into David's eyes and saw his faith. Looked into David's eyes and saw something nobody else saw. At a certain point, we need the discernment to look into the eyes of another believer and see that God has anointed them to do something that we cannot possibly see that they are able to do. The king had some faith. At a certain point, the king said, David, go do your best. I'll be praying for you. I got your back. And this is the hardest part because the faith of the king also had to realize that I can't help you. Your faith has to do it. Yeah, yeah. I can't put my armor on you. Yeah. I can't help you. Yeah. That was one of the hardest things for me to do. Because I want to help you. Yeah, yeah, I want to yeah. put my armor on you. Yeah. Somebody comes to me and they're struggling financially. I want to give you an idea that you can execute to make money for your family. Yeah. And I used to do that all the time. People would come to me struggling and be like, here's what you can do. What you need to do is start a business, and here's how the business you can start, and here's, here's how you can do it, here's how you can set it up. And I used to get frustrated that people wouldn't do it. And I remember I called Pastor Daniels one day, and I said, I'm so worried about this person, and I've given them 10 ideas, and they won't do any of them. And he just laughed at me. He said, Benjamin, you are not the, the head of their household. Why don't you let that man alone? There's no way that man's not going to provide for his family. 
You just encourage him and tell him God's going to empower you to provide for your family. And stop trying to tell him how to do it. I was like, that's true. I realized I was King Saul trying to put my armor on other people. When the five smooth stones that you got are enough. You need to pull out your little sling and grab them five smooth stones. What comes to your heart? You need to do it your way. You need to do it the way God put on the inside of you. You'll never make it trying to wear Saul's armor, doing it the way somebody else told you. Okay, you can win, but only if you do it my way. You can succeed, but only if you do it my way. Here's, here's the only way I can see that you will succeed. Yeah. Saul got to get out the way. Yeah. Sometimes you need to... Let David walk off with his five smooth stones yeah. and his sling yeah. and believe that his God will empower him Amen. to defeat his Goliath. Amen. David goes down there, and we know the story. Goliath curses him in the name of his gods and says, Today I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air. And David says, You come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, and he's going to deliver you into my hand. And David reaches into a satchel and grabs a stone, puts it in a sling, runs at the giant, hits him in the head. The giant falls to the ground. David stands over the giant and lifts up Goliath's own sword. The sword was bigger than David. Yeah. And he looks around in the valley so everybody can see. And he cuts off the head of the giant with his own sword. And he stands in the valley holding the sword in one hand and the head of the giant in the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. And two things happen at that moment. First thing, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. <laughs> they turned it. What happened? The enemy lost heart. The enemy lost heart when the enemy saw that their champion was dead. The problem was that the Philistines put all of their hope in one champion. Wow. What you don't realize is it looks like there's an army that's encamped against you, but at the head of that army is one Goliath, and once you kill that one Goliath, the battle is over. Wow. God is able to give you the wisdom to identify the Goliath at the head of the army that's facing you. Wow. This is why in Psalm 27, the psalmist begins by saying, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David is not worried when an army encamps against him. Why? Because he knows all I have to do is kill one Goliath, and that army will go fling. Listen, God is able to give you such victory that it causes the enemy to lose heart. Amen. The second thing that happened was Israel rose up. The enemy lost heart and Israel suddenly found their heart. When Israel saw that David had won this great victory on their behalf, suddenly they found their hearts. Let me tell you why you need to rise up in faith and face your Goliath. Because there's a whole Israel that is watching you. And when you stand in the valley with a sword in one hand and the head of your Goliath in the other, there's a whole army behind you that's going to rise up in faith. Listen, there's a whole company of people that can't have their victory until you get yours. That can't fight their battle until until you win yours. You've got to face your Goliath because there's people behind you that are waiting for you to stand in the valley with the head of Goliath in one hand and the sword in the other. And when they see your victory, they're going to rise up in faith and they're going to pursue the enemy and they're going to win their battle. Come on, somebody. Read Psalm chapter 20. We will rejoice when you are victorious. There's a whole company of people that are watching you wage your warfare, that are watching you fight your battle, and they will rejoice when you are victorious. Amen. Your children are watching you. They need to see you overcome this. They will rejoice when you are victorious. Your friends are watching you. Your family members are watching you. Your church members are watching The members of your small group are watching you. They need to see you rise up in faith and overcome. You don't realize that your victory will cause a chain reaction. But so will your refusal to face your Goliath. If you run from your Goliath, the rest of your people, everyone watching you, they're going to go hide in their caves. But if you face your Goliath and you defeat your Goliath, there's a whole army that's ready to rise up. A chain reaction of victory is going to follow. Because your victory then becomes the history of correlation that the rest of Israel is watching your victory and saying, I might not have killed a lion and a bear, but I just watched a little kid defeat a giant. Wow. 
And the Lord who gave victory to that little kid, little Obi, went outside and destroyed that gangster. Debo was out there. And Obi went out there and knocked him out with a brick. Nobody else is afraid of any Debo. Because if Obi could do it, so can I. The God who empowered Obi. The God of Obi. Right, Obi? Right? Amen. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And many of you watching me today have lost your hearts. You didn't even know you lost your heart until you came to this service today. And the sign that you lost your heart is that you flee in the face of your Goliath. Wow. There's a Goliath in your heart, in your life. And every time he shows up, you just run. You hide. Afraid to face him. Because all you can see is defeat. All you can see is that this giant is too big for me. Read, read Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath. Mm, yeah. And he talks about the reality that Goliath was actually so big, he probably had a tumor in his brain that caused him to, to keep kept the, the cell receptors in his long bones from, from closing. Yeah. And so he just kept growing and growing and growing. And he talks about how people that get that big, there's some, there's, they actually have brain damage. Yeah. And he talks about there's evidence that Goliath actually was half blind wow. and immobile. He was a sitting giant. He was a sitting duck. He was a target. He was a huge target. Wow. It looked like Goliath had the upper hand. Yeah. Wow. But in actuality, your enemy is immobile. He's just big. Wow. Goliath came stumbling out. He says, you come at me with sticks and stones. David only had one staff. He saw multiple sticks. He was half blind. Oh <laughs> What I'm saying to you is that that enemy is not as tough as you think. Wow. Easier to kill than you can imagine. Yeah. Good. All you need is to find your heart. Amen. Now remember Jesus told these parables in Luke 15. First, the lost sheep. <laughs> Second, the lost coin. Yeah. And then the lost son. Some of you, your heart is like that lost sheep that's wandered off. And Jesus has to go looking for that lost sheep and bring it back to the pen. Yeah. And others of you, your heart is like that lost coin. Yeah. Lost it right inside the house. Some of you lost your heart outside the house. Some of you lost your heart inside the house. Mm. But you lost your heart. Mm. But the promise of God to you today is if you wait on the Lord and be of good courage, mm. he will strengthen your heart. Amen. And today God is coming yeah. to strengthen your heart. He's going to find it. He's going to return it to you. Yeah. But as he does, yeah. you must guard it. Amen. You must make a decision. I'm never losing this again. Yeah. You must treat it as your most valuable possession. Yes. Mm -mm, my heart. My heart. I'm going to keep my heart because it's the wellspring of life. Yeah. Yeah. Everything I do flows out of it. And if I lose it, I'm either not going to be able to do anything or what I do is going to be marked by unbelief and fear. I'm going to keep my heart. Yeah. I'm going to keep it. It's the wellspring of life. Mm. God is able to restore your heart to you today. Mm. If you've lost it, don't worry. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. He'll return it to you. Amen. And again, you will begin to believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's how you know that God's giving you your heart back as you begin to believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And once you begin to believe it, now you know my heart's coming back. My heart is returning to me. I'm believing that I, whatever area you're not able to believe for it, God wants to restore your heart for that area. You look at your marriage. I believe we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the, the living. You see your kids. You look at your finances. You look at your job. You look at your health. I believe mm. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait Amen. on the Lord. Be yeah. of good courage. Yeah. And he shall strengthen your heart. Amen. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you, Father, that you are speaking to us today. You're moving on the hearts of your children today. 
And I pray that you would remove that spirit of fear that causes us to run in terror in the face of our Goliath and replace it with that spirit of faith that causes us to believe and therefore speak, but also prompts us to act, to do something, to fight, to build, to plant, to fix something. It prompts us. Father, I pray that you would release that faith that prompts us to act. Strengthen your people today. Strengthen each and every one. I pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm going to invite my wife to come now, and we just want to take just a few minutes to continue to minister to you today. I just feel the Holy Spirit ministering to hearts right now. Some of you, some of you are just sensing the inflow of the Holy Spirit yeah. right into the space yeah. where you are right mm. now. He's mm. touching your hearts. I just see tears and faces, mm. tears and eyes right now. That's mm. the Holy Spirit moving on you. That's not mm. just emotion, mm. because when the Holy Spirit gives you hope. Mm when you were out of hope, when you had run out of hope. It's mm. a, it's an, sometimes it's an emotional experience, but it's not just emotion, it's deeper than emotion. Mm. That's the Spirit of God moving on you, mm. amen? Amen. You know, God really wants to strengthen your heart mm. today. Mm. You know, as Benjamin was preaching, I realized there's signs. Mm. There's signs that you could really recognize when you have lost heart, mm -hmm. when you want to isolate yourself, mm -hmm. and when you lose that motivation to act. Yep. You know, we were really busy packing and, and moving our stuff into the storage, and I got mad at Benjamin. Remember that? Mm -hmm. What night was that? <laughs> Thursday night? Was that Thursday night? Mm -hmm. So I worked till after midnight because I was afraid of Alethea, uh, not having her school supplies, I was afraid that her stuff could be packed into the storage. So we, I had to pack three different ways. Stuff that goes into the storage, stuff that we're going to take it to our temporary apartment, and then some stuff that we're going to take it to our hotel, right, and her school supplies. And I was just afraid, you know? And so I packed till after midnight, and then when the movers came on Thursday morning, I just did, I'm like, what if like they put everything in the storage? So I was like, how do I make this more easier for Benjamin? So I pushed everything I packed uh, for the storage outside of her door. And I said, Benjamin, that's for the storage. Mm -hmm. And the things that needs to go to the garage that we have to take it to our apartment, I pushed it right inside of her room, right right inside right by the door i said that one goes to the garage that's for the apartment and i pushed the things her uh, uh, clothes and the school supplies against the wall and i said don't touch that it's like yeah 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 got it got it and then thursday night comes right and then Alexia's like my school supplies are packed they're in the storage i'm like what and i was like benjamin and he's like why are you blaming me so who else? It's like the movers did it, but you're supposed to oversee them. Who well, but it's not. And then I was so mad, right? I was so angry. That night, right, the scripture or Bible reading, it's like Ecclesiastes where there's time to be angry there, right? I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm angry. <laughs> I was so, once I lost heart because I worked so hard from to prevent something to happen and I worked hours to make that happen and when I wasn't able to prevent it I lost heart and then I ate bread right I ate four Korean bakeries I thought eating this Whole is bakeries. right uh, I mean bread from the Korean bakery right I mean I was only allowed to eat one a day, but I ate four that night. And I didn't want to exercise. I just wanted to be inside. I lost motivation to act. And I remember Friday, as I laid in the empty room, I thought, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't have any desire to act. I have no desire to do anything. And when I felt that, I just got dressed. And then I went for a bike ride. And they store that too, but I asked Benjamin to help me take it out. And I went on 20 mile bike ride. 
As I acted, something came inside of my heart. I felt life again. I felt forgiveness come into my heart. You did? Yeah. Hallelujah. When I, you see, when you lose the motivation to act, even physically, you gotta just get up and you gotta just act. And in the, in the moment of acting, right, it comes back. Right? And what I realized is this, a lot of you, you've lost heart and you stopped trying. But I feel like God is saying, how are you going to find your heart? Isn't by just waiting on the Lord inside of your room, watching Netflix. You got to get up. Right. You got to get up, go walk around your neighborhood right. and pray. You got to get up. If, if you can't get out, you know, uh, out, out of the house, walk around your room, right? What, what, what am I doing every night? Where, where, where am I doing that? In the bedroom or in, in the, the closet. Bedroom. You know what I realized is that there is no excuse. There is no excuse to uh, not acting, right? Not doing the things that you know is right. So today, we implore you, we encourage you. Get up, get up, get up. Don't sit there and allow the enemy to take your heart further away. When you act, God is going to empower your movement, right? Yeah, and right. he's going to help you recover your heart. So true. Amen? So true. Amen? All right, let's pray. I want to pray for you one more time. And then um, what you could do is if you need, I'm, well, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to end the service. And then after that, uh, if you have any uh, prayer requests, we want to pray for you. Yeah. So will you join with me right now? Father, I pray in Jesus name yes, God. Yes, God. that you would, God, release, that you would fan the faith. You would, God, and strengthen the hearts of your sons and daughters, Lord. God, that you would help us recover our encouragement, our hearts, God, to believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, God, for our spiritual life, for our relationships, God, for our finances, Lord, God, for our destinies. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Empower your people to act. Empower your people to act this week, not tomorrow, even today, even today, empower your people to dress themselves and even walk around the house, God, empower your people to make some phone calls, God, empower your people to act, return the motivation, God, to act, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Mm.